Hello, and welcome to the All Things Narrative podcast, where we explore the relationships between the stories we love and the stories we live. I'm your host, Derek Hatch, and let's get started. All right, welcome back to the top of the month. It is June. It is summertime. Many of you guys are getting out of school. It is so good to be here, to be podcasting for you all. And um, just thank you uh, for those of you who have uh, just been taking the time to just share what you think of this podcast or about an episode. Um, I love hearing your feedback. And if you've been enjoying this show and you'd like to go leave a review, um, please feel free to do so. You could do that on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. And it's just fun. It just helps to get this show out to more people. And so, yeah, this is exciting. And uh, I feel like we're getting a good groove going. And, you know, at the top of the month, we like to talk about somebody's story. Uh, But today, I actually have several people on and to talk about um, the stories of what they do with narrative practices uh, in their lives and in their careers. And so I'm so excited because I've got a few people here today that I've had the pleasure of getting to know over the last year. Uh, They were in my cohort for the Narrative Practices Master's Program uh, over at Dulwich and the University of Melbourne. And so I just love getting to, to talk and listen because there's a lot of wisdom that they have. And so I hope this is something that you enjoy as well out there um, as we get to just hear a little bit about people uh, in different backgrounds and in different parts of the world. So first up, we have got Kate. Hi, I'm Kate Hislop. I live in Basselton, Western Australia, Wadande Buja, the home of the saltwater people. Um, so storytelling is just part of my life. It's what I work with. It's what I play. Awesome. Thank you, Kate. And I'm very excited to get to hear uh, about, you know, what you're doing with storytelling and helping uh, other people to tell their stories. We also got... Toby. Thanks, Derek. Um, So my name is Toby Rader. I live in um, a little community called Port Alberni on Vancouver Island on the western shores of um, Canada. And um, I'm in calling in from the home and the territory of the Tishat and Upanishad people um, and the Nichana speaking people. Uh, So, I mean, I think a lot like Kate, storytelling has been part of my life from a a young age, um, even in a nonverbal way. and um, I am, you know, honored to say that I am a second generation narrative practitioner. And I think yeah. that's a pretty amazing thing for, for me. So, yeah, thank you. Awesome. It's so good to have you here, Toby. And finally, we have a returning guest in the house. Uh, if you checked out our uh, episode last month, uh, the story of becoming an inclusive storyteller, uh, we have Kristen back. Hi, Derek and everybody. Thanks so much for having me back. And it's Kristen Pedamonti, and I am in Allentown, Pennsylvania, in the mid-Atlantic of the U.S., and it's the unceded territory of the Lene Lenape and the Delaware, original stewards of the land. Uh, And (laughs) similar to Kate and Toby, I guess storytelling's been a part of my journey for as long as I can remember. I can't even tell you exactly where it first started. And uh, the inclusive part, I guess if that was anything I would focus on is a lifelong interest in how do we um, maybe bring in stories that aren't always heard Mm. or seen or noticed. And I'm really interested in opening opening up pathways for people to be able to share their lived experiences, especially with the interest of breaking stereotypes and making connections across perceptions of difference. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Kristen. It's good to have you back. Nice to be here. So all, all four of us here, we clearly have a passion for story and storytelling. And so I figured it might be fun to kind of start off um, just talking about maybe a story recently that you've come across. It could be either be, you know, a true story in the world or it could be, you know, a fictional story. So like, for example, I saw a movie a couple months ago. You guys ever heard of a a Tick, Tick, Boom? Yes. (laughs) Yeah. So I had, I had never like seen the musical, heard of it, but I'm a major Andrew Garfield fan. 
Um, he's my man crush. So Andrew Garfield getting to sing and, you know, all the recognition he's gotten and getting the Oscar nomination stuff. I'm like, yeah, I'm not missing this. So I finally saw it and it was so moving to me because like in the story, he's turning 30 and you guys know that I just turned 30 a few months ago. So, and like the thoughts and the things that he says in that movie are things that I've thought and said. And it was like, like this whole idea of like feeling like I'm reaching this, this new decade, this new chapter of my life. And I don't know what I'm doing with it. I don't feel like I've accomplished much. And I know that's not true for me, but these are real thoughts and things I struggle with. So, you know, and in that movie, of course, I don't want to like spoil it if you haven't seen it, but the way that the movie kind of ends and how it's not quite the resolution that you think it's going to be and that it sets you up for, it actually was very encouraging to me as like, I'm like trying to be in this new chapter and starting this business and all that stuff and realizing like, just because you love something and you're passionate about it, that doesn't mean that it's going to be like a home run right away. Because we have all these stories um, that sometimes can really, they can really discourage us, like stories of people who just like out of the gate, you know, like they make it big and it looks like there's, there's no like obstacles and you're just like, man, like why is this so hard for me? Like why can't it come like that? And I, I so appreciated like watching a journey and realizing that even in the journey, it still didn't have that resolution that he was hoping for. And that's sometimes what life can feel like. You know, now that you've learned this, now you need to push and you need to go to the next place. So this idea of not necessarily arriving, but that we're continuing to learn and grow, that was so encouraging for me. So what about you guys? Any comments on that or any stories that you guys want to share that have really inspired you lately? I just have a comment on it because I, I've watched it three or four times now, tick, tick, boom. Yeah. And I, I really resonated with what you said about the the un, like what I'm hearing is the unfolding of the journey and things not necessarily working out a certain way. And, and yet it can be a launching point. That's kind of what I heard you say, like yeah. this other launch that maybe you couldn't envision and, um, and taking, I think too, taking some of the pressure off, no matter what age there's these, mm -hmm. these constructs of by a certain age, we're supposed to do X, Y, Z or yeah. have whatever figured Those out. Kind of normative <laughs> expectations. Right. And I'm just thinking as, I don't know about anybody else in, in the room, but as entering each decade and what I thought it was going to look like, it's very different from what maybe I thought. Mm -hmm. And what if that's okay? And what if that could be exciting rather than a pressure? Yeah. And I think that we don't ever, I don't know my journey, I shouldn't speak for anyone, anyone else, but the idea of, oh, well now I'm 50. So I'm supposed to have all this wisdom and know these things. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm not sure that's true at all. And just to have a, oh, well, maybe 50 can look like this. And it doesn't have to look like something in particular. Sure. So, yeah, I just, I love that. I love the story, uh, too. <clears throat> so, yeah. thanks for also. <laughs> yeah. Toby, Kate, anything, any stories you want to share about? Mm. I, I sort of just like, I don't know if I have a story, but I, I think that idea that we have a story, a story told to us as to how we're to be at each decade and a, and a story that we then tell ourselves, right? Yeah. And sometimes, they're, sometimes they're not. Um, I think that, I think I look to my elders. So um, my, my mother, my, my father or their, their, you know, their parents who are deceased, the relationships I had with those people mm -hmm. and, and, and realize that that those that those stories that are told to us and the stories that we make up for ourselves, like they don't matter anymore. They're not. I don't know if I'm making myself clear or understandable, but it's. I'll use my grandfather as an example. I, you know, he lived to be 96, mm. um, and you know, like I can tell a story about him and stories about him, but there are lots of things that you know he grew up. He comes from a generation that he was to be a certain person and be a certain way, mm. and. Um, and he would say to me, I remember him saying it at, at, at towards the end of his life, you know, like nothing matters, but the treasures I have in my life. And those treasures are the memories I have with my children and my grandchildren and my great grandchildren. And I, and I think that that 
that's what I try to carry forward. Like as far as like my feelings around where I'm supposed to be, I turned 41 on Tuesday. And, oh, wow. And like, okay. thank you. It, you know, it took me, it took me 20 years to get a master's degree and 20 years to get a bachelor's degree, but that doesn't, doesn't change who I am and where I'm going and the type of direction I want in my life. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, I had children, you know, as far as my community is concerned, I had children late in my life. Um, but yeah, I think this, I think that those stories that are told to us about us become so harmful. Um, yeah. I think that's the beauty of this work or the beauty of telling story is that we get to adjust and change and, and kind of make it our, our own. Right. Yeah. Um, my grandfather always started a story. He used to tell us stories at night and he would say, uh, once upon a time and all great stories start with once upon a time. Mm-hmm. And I, and I like, I think that is like the metaphor for it all in my opinion. So I, that's my piece. I, Kate, if there's anything you want to add to that or say more to. Yeah. Look, I work with people all the time. Um, doing what we call legacy stories Mm. and how I begin any workshop or whatever is this is your story. You get to tell it your way. Mm -hmm. So if you want to change the story, go for it. Cause it it doesn't, the, the baseline of your story isn't going to change. The details can change, Mm -hmm. but that the feelings behind your story will stay the same. And I guess that's sort of a premise from which um, story making really becomes part of us. Yeah. Yeah. Cause there's something powerful about, you know, we get these glimmers um, where we might see something like reflected, like in a story, like you have these thoughts of like, Oh, I've, I've thought that too before, you know? And it's interesting because when we think about our own stories and we realize that, that is what we have control over, that we can have agency over our stories, the way we tell our stories and the way we live our stories. And so like Kate, what you mentioned there, like, can you tell us a little bit more about um, those workshops that you do and, and your business and, and what all that entails? Okay, so I do narrative therapy a little bit differently than many because I mix narrative and art therapy together. I love that. So I work with people where the sort of signature part of my business is called um, from storyboard to print. Mm -hmm. And within usually in a group, um, people go from a concept to a book that goes into the design studio within 10 weeks or thereabouts. Mm -hmm. And they're creating a 24, 32 page picture book. Mm. So not only are they telling their story in words but they're telling it through illustration as well wow and and for these people they run up into different roadblocks than others because i can't draw Mm. nobody told me i was going to be drawing i don't want to draw Mm -hmm. and it brings up all sorts of stuff which is just fun it just becomes banter and so um the i run workshops in a very playful manner Mm -hmm. um and sometimes they're playful, even though the topics are very serious. Yeah. So um, your legacy is how you want to leave it. So if you're, for example, if you um, happen to be in a group of uh, people who are in that group because of experiences they've had, perhaps domestic violence or something, we don't have to do the heavy stories. Mm-hmm. We can actually do your chicken soup recipe. It's okay. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. that's sort of the whole way it works. I'm not sure if I'm making that very clear. But to leave a legacy is like leaving a little bit of your soul. So it doesn't have to be the grit and the grime and the dirt. Yeah. It's a piece of you. So, so Kate, what... What really attracted you to this idea of legacy and working with people to to tell and and design and publish their stories in this way? I used to do it with my children when they were little, and you know it was before we had even had a computer. Mm. Um, I mean, I'm aging myself clearly, but um, 
you know, I hit, I hit the 60 mark. So, yeah, it's a different ball game. So we used to do it, and I still have all their original books they did when they were tiny. Mm-hmm. Um, and they did. They did the whole binding process of making a book. And then later I started doing them in the schools. Mm. And then what I realized was that it wasn't, perhaps it wasn't the schools that needed the program as much as the parents of the students. Mm. And then it went in a whole different direction. And I don't always know what I'm going to get coming in the door. Sometimes I do if it's a specific group that's come in. Mm -hmm. Um, But within any group of people, there's an enormous variance of what's going on. So when, when they, when they come in um, and they, you, you mentioned that sometimes they might have hesitancy of like, Oh, I don't know how to draw or uh, maybe they're trying to figure out what aspect of their story they want to tell. Or sometimes it's because somebody else has paid for them to come to the program. Okay. And suddenly they're supposed to be an author. Okay. And they're feeling that they might let that person down. Mm-hmm. There's a whole, there can be any myriad of things going on. Yeah. Um, yeah. So a lot of what happens is purely about making the place safe, mm. making storytelling a safe and respectful room, I guess. How do you do that? God, I don't know. Um <laughs> I listen very carefully. I don't judge. Mm -hmm. Um, People can say what they like. Uh, People always have a right not to speak. Mm. I can give you a sort of bizarre, funny example. I worked with a group of adults who all had intellectual and and physical disabilities. One of the girls I was told would not speak. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, she was in a group of 12 people and they were drawing and then they were talking about the drawings and I like, I'm thick, right? I forget. So I forgot that this kid didn't speak. And so I said, you know, it's your turn. And she told me about the drawings she did. She did speak. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we just kept it up. It just, I just didn't treat her any differently. And when we launched the books, because the book launches are public, mm-hmm. or many of them are public. When we launched it, she was invited onto the stage and I reminded the audience and there would have been a couple of hundred people there. And I reminded them that she didn't have to speak, that she, we just needed to see who she was. And she came up to the front and I said, you know, do you want to say anything? She said, oh, no, no. <laughs> that was fine. And then she grabbed my arm and she said, I want to read my book. Mm. Well, the whole audience went silent and there we had this young woman read every page of her 24 page book out loud to a whole group of people. Like the whole, everyone was in tears. Wow. It was beautiful. So I come from a premise of we don't know. We don't know what doors are going to open. Sure. And let's just let it all happen. When they get to share their stories in front of an audience, is yeah. like how do you how do you create that audience? Where do they come from? Do they know the person? Oh, do they okay. not? Most books created being book incubator are for family are specifically for family and friends. Okay. Okay. So when we have a book launch, it's a very safe audience. Mm. And the participants have all been planning the launch. That's all part of the program. Right? Okay. So they 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 know it. They know what to expect. Expect well. Sometimes they know what to expect. Um, at that same launch, I had a young man stand up and want to thank his mother who had presented, and that was cool. And then he said, "You know," and then I'd like to thank her in my way too, in my traditional way. And I thought, "Okay, cool." I'm expecting him to give her some flowers, right? Yeah. But no, he and his brother and their three sons come on to the stage, and they do a haka. Now, they are less than 10 feet away from people with um, high levels of autism Mm -hmm. who have not been warned. So my heart's in my throat, and I'm thinking, oh, no, this could be interesting. 
But no, these every participant who was there was so excited because they knew this was for this other person. Mm -hmm. And then if it was for her, it was for them. Mm. And yeah, it was amazing. Had I been asked ahead of time, sadly, I think I would have said no. Wow. So I'm so glad I wasn't asked. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, I would have gone down that safety route. If I'm not sure that. We haven't had enough time to prepare this, make sure everybody understands. Um, had I had even a week's notice, I would have been fine. But yeah. Anyway, I can imagine. We didn't have that. Well, I can imagine it's very key in what you do to stay, you know, for those of you who don't know narrative practices, we have kind of a, a core value, if you will, of being decentered yet influential, or you might've heard influential yet decentered. Um, and that's, Something we haven't talked about much yet on the podcast, but basically this idea of as narrative practitioners, we're not there to try to assert and center ourselves and what we want out of the conversation or with the person that we're working with. We really want to allow the person right in front of us to be at the center of it, their story, their narrative, their wants, whatever we can do for them. That's the influential part. Um, but we want to always be aware that we're not centering ourselves. And it sounds like, Kate, in the work that you're doing, that, that's got to be very important, right? To stay decentered yeah. as, as people are learning. It's not about me. Yeah. It, for me, in a group situation, it's about building a sense of safety for that group. Yeah. And, yeah, they rely a bit on each other. Mm-hmm. I'm just there to sort of, heard the cats <laughs> you know it, it's really lovely yeah so Kristen and toby as you're as you're kind of hearing kate talk about this a little bit of witnessing here why not um you know as you're as you're hearing this what was maybe like some of the something that you noticed that really stood out to you or something that maybe like an image that came to mind uh, about Kate or what what she values or any anything you want to share about that at all? Yeah, Kristen. For me, it was how very much in in action that your story, your way is being is being lived, hmm. and the story of the young woman who she was told, oh, you know, this person doesn't speak. That, that may be a story that was placed on this woman and who knows all the layers. And that's something I appreciate so much about narrative practice is the, the looking at those layers of influence mm. on that story that that person is carrying with them. Yeah. And just imagining, imagining the layers to for that young woman to read her book and what that must have felt like for her, for the audience to get to witness that. And then at the same time, the, the, uh, I'm sorry, I might mispronounce it. Haka dance. I think. Haka. Yeah. The Haka dance too. And how that was again, their story, their way and honoring their mother. So there were so Mm. many layers of that happening. And I find that, I find that just so on that just really touched my, my heart that that got to happen, that people got to express in ways that felt felt good for them Mm -hmm. and then the audience got to see that too and then you kate as the as the herder of the cats to use you know that that you got to witness that as well Mm. so there's so many layers of um another story being created Mm. right in the moment along with that print story there's so much it was magical yeah there's so much happening and later later i'd um Later, Derek, when I'll talk about the Kintsugi work, mm-hmm. there's there's some there's some intersectionality there. And Toby, yeah, you know, I want to turn it. If you had something you wanted, I'm sure there's something you'd like to hear about what you heard. Or I I kind of wanted to to address this, um, Kate, and it's not to pick on you, but it's sort of an interesting turn on a story in that you felt that had you been warned beforehand, you would have said no, mm-hmm. and and how rooted that is in a dominant story that we as particularly as educated white privileged people (laughs) make a decision about right Mm -hmm. that that we we go to that place of like well we just wouldn't do that because that and and that when we don't when we don't allow that story to dominate our choices or decisions and that we we literally center 
the story and the person, we, we, we actually get to witness these really beautiful and amazing moments. Um, and, but just how easy it is for us to allow a, a dominant story that is probably a story that is even told about us. Like I imagine that for Kate, that there is a story in her life where somebody has told her, make, make the safe right decision this way, right? And I think that, that it, it's beautiful when we can step away from that. And I think that's something that, that you know, what, Kate, what you're doing, but what narrative allows for us to do, because it forces us to think about the person in, in, in the work, right? Um, it's something that I speak to all the time in my work is, is centering that, the people we work alongside. Right. Toby and I would and Toby I'd love to that could be a great transition actually to talking about the work that you do but before I do I want to see Kate did you have any uh, thing that you wanted to respond to with Kristen and Toby or any other uh, things you wanted to add about what you shared about the work you do no I think it's um, my learning from that particular event was how glad I was that I didn't know mm. I mean it, it could have gone sideways but there was also heaps of support in the room and it was a really friendly audience. Um, <laughs> but it didn't and it was magical. Yeah. So, but yeah, but I think I think it's really honest. Uh, oh, I know it's very honest to say that had I been asked that day, I, I'm sure I would have said no. Or, or I would have needed to have a meeting with the people who were about to launch and that would have just been an added thing that they weren't ready for mm-hmm. you know sort of a conversation around it whereas this just happened it was spontaneous it was beautiful yeah can i may i ask a i have a follow-up has mm-hmm. that has that experience of how it was received the haka dance has that now influenced how you might respond in another scenario that may have or may not have similarities <laughs> You know, I, I don't know because every, all these things are all so individual. Yeah. Um, I tend to work from a place of trusting the author. Mm. And I know that I had an author on that stage who was beaming, like just so proud of her sons and her grandsons that, yeah, I mean, I just stepped back. I want to transition to Toby for a little while. And so Toby's a little bit different than the rest of us. Cause I believe Toby, you're, you're in the social work field, right? Yeah. I mean, essentially I'm, a, I am a registered social worker here in British Columbia. Um, so I'm a member of the college of social workers and a member of the BC um, association of social workers. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, my work has for the past two decades been primarily with with um, people in community, adults and youth who are struggling with uh, mental well-being, mental health um, and and substance misuse. And so that's from gambit from working in, in, in um, residential settings to working right on the street with with um, folks who are experiencing shelterlessness and homelessness. Um, and currently what I'm doing now, which has been a really change for me, is, is working directly with uh, frontline workers and first responders who are, who really are mandated to, to provide service to those who have been uh, impacted by two public health emergencies here in this province. And, and, and one is the, the overdose crisis, which is related to the, um, what our province likes to call toxic drug supply, what I like to call political poisonings. <laughs> Um, and, and they're very different ways of understanding the situation. Um, and then the other one, obviously, is COVID-19. Mm. Um, and, and what's happened is that we have recognized that, you know, whether you're directly or indirectly affected by these uh, emergencies, you need service as a frontline worker. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a shortage of workers in this province. And so um, we do what they call psychosocial support. It's a way of getting around saying that we do counseling, <laughs> saying that we're doing therapy, um, because we're really, that's what we're doing. Um, but, 
I think like beyond what I do, like officially that gives me a paycheck and that kind of stuff. My, my work has really been about helping and advocating for other stories to be told mm. where they're, where they're not being heard. Um, and, and particularly with those who, um, you know, to quote Miss Vicki Reynolds, who don't belong, who are part of the non-belonging um, or the marginalized, as we tend to call them. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that that's, that's really where my work has been, and it continues to be. I, I mean, I, I encounter frontline workers or first responders who um, definitely feel like the system has forgotten them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So how do you go about doing that uh, for those who, who don't belong? Um, and that's a great quote, by the way, that you, you were sharing. How do you go about making those stories known? Yeah, so that's a, that's a, that's a great question, Derek. I think the this, this struggle always is that um, there has to be room or, or space given for that story to be told the way it is intended to be told by that person. Mm. Um, and that is not always a verbal way. You know, I mean, you're all very aware of my, my project in the Masters was around the use of silence mm-hmm. in narrative. Mm-hmm. And sometimes, I guess for me, silence speaks volumes more than what is said. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I mean, I have sat in, you know, I recently sat in, in uh, a workshop with, with some people and we, we literally sat in silence for 20 minutes before anybody said anything. I know I welcomed them in the room and, and I did my little piece of my land acknowledgement and all of that stuff, but then we just sat. Um, and it, and it was a woman brought up a story about her partner, you know, her brother and her son dying on the streets that engaged the conversation of this other thing. Right. Mm. Um, and so I think that the beauty is asking those questions ab- about the story that is being told. And it's the curiosity that I, I'm curious about the story. I'm curious about um, what they make meaning of. A lot of my work is done around what we typically call grief and loss mm. in the world, particularly in the Western world. Um, and I'm really more interested in what do those stories, what does that person made meaning of? What does that person made possible? And, and all of those types of questions. Yeah. Um, so I think that that's how I, how I bring those stories out. And I think the other piece is, is, is trying to um, engage them in storytelling is, is always the, um, is always the place I want to be. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, I have a, I have just started a private practice and I have this, this young man who comes to see me every week mm-hmm. and, um, and he is, he is, has autism and, um, he's 13 and he really likes horror and gore. And so we'd have conversations about horror and gore in relation to his depression. And that's how he expresses it. Um, and and it's and that's that's all that we're doing is we're t- we're sp- I spend an hour with them on my couch and he talks to me about horror and gore. Mm-hmm. Well, you're you're engaging, you're connecting with him, uh, you're meeting him with the stories that he connects with, and there's obviously cool. a reason why he probably likes horror and gore, and I'm sure that's part of the conversation is why does he gravitate towards those kinds of stories? Yeah. He doesn't, he doesn't have an answer for me on that. That's a funny, that's, a, that's yeah. the question, right? That's the first question I ask is why do you do that? He doesn't have an answer because I like it. Yeah. And that's fine. Like, we, I don't need to know why you like it. I want to know more about how um, horror and gore is influencing him or how it is um, allowing for him to express himself, right? Yeah, and he may not know, you know, because I, I run into that all the time with teenagers is – they may not always know why they liked something. Like I, I like asking them a lot of questions about it. Like, tell me about the characters. Tell me about, you know, you know, like when they make a choice, like this is a great thing to do with teenagers is like when a character makes a toy choice. Oh, what are your thoughts on that choice? Do you, mm-hmm. do you agree with it? Disagree with it? Is it a choice, you know, that you were rooting for a choice, you know, cause it's interesting to, to try to help them articulate that. Because I know sometimes they don't always know how. Um, 
I had a, a, a question that came up in my mind a few minutes ago when you're talking about silence. Um, silence is something I naturally suck at. So I have to like, you know, really discipline myself with it. And with what you were sharing about creating that space, because like you said, you start and then 20 minutes of silence, I would have just been tempted to just talk, you know? And I think that's what, how many of us feel in those moments of silence. We feel that pressure like, oh, I have to say something, you know? Everyone's looking at me. I, I started this thing. So how do you, and it, and it reminds me with what you shared about grief and loss, it reminds me of the spiritual practices of like lament, you know, um, of really when you experience these things and you're with a group of people taking the time to be silent and taking the time to honor um, those those feelings that you're having from these experiences and whatnot. So how do you, and I know this was a big part of your project, but how do you like really, I don't know if it's cultivate, discipline, I don't know what the right word is, but how do you be intentional about the power of silence and narrative practices? Because that's something I don't hear much talked about, you know, the relationship between them. So can you maybe tell a little more of what that's like? Yeah, so it's a great question. And, and it's something that, you know, was definitely posed to me by uh, Dulwich and by Melbourne as to how, how am I actually practicing that, given that narratives about storytelling and, and traditionally that is a verbal response. Um, and just before I get into like all of that detail, I guess part of it is a historical thing for me. So I was a child who was nonverbal until I was six. Mm. Uh, and I, I didn't learn to read or write until I was 12 years old, years old, right? Um, so I spent a lot of time watching what people do and, and literally watching like the micro expressions, watching the physical movement, watching the way somebody's um, eyebrows raised up or down, right? Those types of things spoke to how I understood the world around me. And so I'm very comfortable in a place of silence um, because when it is silent, um, my, my brain is calm and I can spend more time watching and observing and learning. Um, so I guess, I guess like it's a natural thing for me. How do I bring it into narrative practice as being a really interesting process? Um, because I, I have to, I've had to figure a way of explaining it. And, and I, I guess one of the things that is, is, is really interesting is that if you look back at early works of Michael White and David Epstein, um, particularly, um, narrative means to therapeutic ends they talk very clearly in that about the use of silence um waiting and observing and watching mm. and 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 their intent behind therapeutic letters was to bridge the gap of silence between a session mm. and 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 that sort of i mean that is in in lots of ways how narrative came to be right was was trying to address the unspoken mm -hmm. you know we talk about mm -hmm. the absent but implicit yeah. part but i think that that's what storytelling does is the storytelling speaks to the to the silence it speaks to the piece that isn't being said and um and so I'll give you an example i'll give you two examples i i, I worked in a treatment center and i had a young woman who came she was they were there for six weeks and it was an indigenous treatment center. So silence is really big within indigenous culture, particularly here on the West coast where, um, you know, colonization here is very new as far as Canada goes. So the, the West coast of Canada is like, you know, colonization happened later than the rest of Canada. Mm. Um, but practice is silence, right? When you, when you sit with an elder, you, you wait for the elder to talk and you wait for the elder to be finished talking. And here um, where I come from, and then the child is speaking people, they talk very, there's a very slow cadence to their speech. So you get used to really sitting in silence on that. So this young woman would come every day, every day she would come to group, she wouldn't say a word. And twice a week, she would sit in counseling with me and she didn't say a word for six weeks, nothing. Mm. And I didn't, I didn't push it. I just let her be because it's not my time. It's her time, right? It's not her story. It's, it's not my story. It's her story. So Five minutes before the end of our last session on, the, on week six, I said, I said to her, it is, we're coming to the end of our time. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for coming. 
And she looked at me and she said, Toby, this is the safest time I've ever had in my life. Wow. At 23 years old, she got up and she walked out. And I think that that is the, that is the essence of silence and narrative practice. That is the essence of silence in any kind of therapeutic situation is our goal is to create safety. As Kate had said, create a place of safety. And we do that without taking up space, without being in that room, right? All of her problems were there in that room. All of her, all of her struggles, all of the things that she's ex- experienced in her life were in that room with us. We didn't need to talk to them at all. What she needed was a space where she could simply just be, right? Yeah. And, and that was more powerful than going than, than talking about her story. Or, and I, you know what? I, I know what her story is because, because I, I read it on paper, right? They, they, they told me before they came, but I don't, that story isn't the story that needed to be told. The mm-hmm. story that needed to be told was her place, her need for safety. Wow. And that right. spoke volumes. It speaks volumes, right? Kristen, Kate, as you're hearing Toby share all this, is there anything that you resonate with in your work or anything that, um, you know, that you'll take with you? Yeah, go ahead, Kristen. Oh my gosh. I mean, the, the sentence that is sitting with me is silence as a bridge. Yeah. And then silence as the story that you just shared is so powerful. And I, and I'm imagining that to some extent, that's the story for very many people to have a space where they can just be. And I'm thinking about some people that, that I've feel, you know, just honored to work with who've said things like I'm therapied out. I just want to sit with you. Mm-hmm. And that's where the kintsugi work in an art. So it's a Japanese art, a break uh, of, of mending broken pottery. Mm-hmm. And that's the, that's one of the ways to tell the story is what are you seeing in the pieces? What does broken, what does that word signify for you? What are the layers? What's the glue that assists you to mend? What are the skills you're using while you're mending this piece of pottery? So we do the physical art and we talk about the metaphors and, and it, it brought to mind how that doing that process, both talking and metaphorically and then doing the physical art process is another way for people to be able to talk about things in a a safety. You know, they don't have to talk about the direct details of something. They can speak in metaphor. And what I'm hearing with the silence too, is another, another way to speak without speaking. There's so much Toby, like you've said, both here today and and in your work, there's so much silence speaks volumes and there's so many different types of silence. Yeah. And that safety piece you know, if, if there's anything I continue to carry from your work and your influence on my work, Toby, it is creating more spaces for silence. And I noticed that I pause longer now and I sit with that because my backstory of silence was silence being very uncomfortable, mm-hmm. silence being not talking about the elephant in the room. And I've really had to unlearn that story, honor that story, acknowledge that story and remember that silence can also be safety. Silence can be comfort. Silence can be um, honoring culture. You know, you brought in um, First Nations, Indigenous peoples, and the elders, and having that silence as an honoring too. I mean, that's what I was hearing under. I, I might be not. That might not be uh, correct, but that the honoring and and then the other silence part that that I'm carrying with this is. Silence as a bridge to safety, silence as a bridge to story being shared in that person's preferred way. And what, and oh my gosh, what a gift for that woman to have all that time with you without, without any pressure, Mm -hmm. you know, that she could sit there and there wasn't this expectation of eventually we're going to talk about something, you know, that it was, here's this, this is what this person is resonating with. Wonderful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I think that to add to that is that piece of that she sat with a male. Let's be honest. She sat with a white social yeah, worker that too. in a space and said nothing. I felt comfortable and safe in that space to do that. And that that doesn't that's not about me. That has nothing. That has nothing to do with me. That is entirely where she felt comfortable in sharing what she felt was sharing. Right. Mm-hmm. But was was I'm going to sit in the space with you, and I'm okay with that. I'm okay to sit in the space with this man. 
So, yeah. Kate, anything that you wanted to add? Yeah, Toby, as you told your story, what I saw was this woman who was gently wrapped in a blanket, a blanket of silence. Mm. And she could have pushed it off if she wanted to, or she could have cuddled under more if she wanted to. But she had the safety and the comfort. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. So, Toby, do you have any, any cut before we go to Kristen? Do you have any final thoughts? Any, anything you want to add? Anything that you haven't shared uh, that might be important for people to know about what you do or anything related to narrative practices? I don't know. I think the, the thing that I, I always want people to take away from my practice is that um, I am not the expert in any way. <laughs> and, and, um, and I don't, I don't have a magic cure. I, you know, I'm, I think I'm pretty, pretty clear about that. I'm pretty blunt sometimes and, and it rubs people the wrong way, but it's, it is uh, really important that people understand that that the more we talk about it in a different way and the more we change the language, we think about what is affecting us or what the problem might be. You know, again, the problem, you're not the problem, the problem's the problem. Mm -hmm. um, and what that relationship is with that, um, <laughs> that I can't solve that for you, but I can walk with you in it. Yeah. And I, and it's very similar to what Kate is doing and what Kristen is doing as well, right? Um, and, and what you're doing, Derek, you're, you're walking with people and telling their story. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we do that through being curious. And I tell people all the time, I'm just really, really curious about you. I'm really curious about your story. Tell me more. And 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 my job is to ask those provocative questions that um, bring the story out further. So. I love it. Yeah. Thank you. So last but not least, we've got Kristen who's going to, um, you know, the listeners, most listeners who are listening to this, hopefully you've heard Kristen's story and you've gotten to hear about the work that she's done. But one of the things that uh, we didn't get to talk about as much as we would have liked is about your Kintsugi work. And now some time has passed since we last spoke and you've had the chance to start a tour and do some traveling. And so I'd love to hear, you know, how all that's been going. Well, thank you. Uh, and I wanted to circle back to a, a thread that was going through in uh, and connecting to Kate's tagline for Book Incubator about your story, your way, mm. and, then, and then connecting that to the safety aspects in both Kate's shares and Toby's shares. And that's where this Kintsugi piece uh, has been is really well received and seems like a a, a, re a vehicle that resonates for people mm -hmm. in that it gives space to, I was saying earlier in the conversation, to speak about some things metaphorically mm -hmm. that a person might not yet be ready to talk about directly head on. And the idea, the other part is, I was thinking too about it's there's also kinesthetic learning yeah. when persons are doing the art process of it. And Kate, to circle back to something you said about like this idea of, oh, I can't draw. Oh, my gosh. And that playfulness of the space. So in doing this Kintsugi work and setting the setting the space, the, the safer space is there's no wrong way to do this. There's no one way to do this. There's no right way to do this. This is really about an opportunity to notice to notice what's happening, notice what's happening when the, the piece of pottery, when the person gets to break it. Mm. And that can be a whole conversation depending on what, what are the layers of story, the multi-story the person's bringing in the room. Yeah. You know, are they, are they a person with lived experience of domestic violence? So that breaking that vessel, what might that mean to that person? And I've, I've to witness women saying it felt so liberating to break something with permission. Wow. And I wasn't going to be screamed at for breaking it. Mm -hmm. Or someone who got in trouble for breaking things when they were a kid, they actually, and there's sometimes delight 
So there's so many layers of what happens and then they get to break the vessel and then looking at those pieces. What are you seeing in the pieces? What might these represent for you? And then people noticing, um, I just did a recent, a recent session with someone and they said, oh, wow, it, uh, they chose a flower pot that had been given to them. And when they broke it, there were two large pieces that broke off. And this is person is also a survivor of, of, uh, breast cancer and had okay. to have a total mastectomy. And she said, Oh, these, these, these were my, these are like my breast. <laughs> and I'm like, that's amazing. Like that's what she saw in the pieces of pottery. And as mm-hmm. she was gluing it together, there were, there were these, all these small shards and a story of perfectionism. Mm-hmm. And this moment of I'm choosing to not put all these little pieces back together wow. because I don't need them. Mm-hmm. I don't need them. And there was one piece that wasn't fitting and for her, that became a story of a year ago, I would have tried to force that in there. But now I'm going to leave it slightly. It's not flush with the rest of the pieces. But what if that's OK? So we had this whole conversation about how might that then um, extend to other areas of her story in life and what else might not have to fit perfectly? And, and what did it, what did it mean to her to let those other small pieces go? And again, how might that relate to other aspects? And it's just such a profound practice and it's so different each time, you know, that's the part about not being a formula. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's certain things that are offered up and everything's an invitation to break the bowl, or maybe the person doesn't want to break it. That's Mm -hmm. fine too. I've had some people, all they want to do is smash the, the pottery into smithereens. Great. Let's talk about that then. What came up for you as you did that? And what do you yeah. notice? What stories are coming to mind with that? Um, some people choose to put only some of the pieces back together. Great. What does that mean for you? So that decentered part that was brought in the conversation earlier, you know, it's really about that person, their experience. What what do they want to do with this process? And so I'm in I'm in process now of going out on a mending what's broken tour mm. with frontline workers, with caregivers, with survivors, with people who've had COVID. I mean, it's a broad range of people. I'm working with a trans community in Nashville. Mm. Um, it's a lot of different populations to have space to talk about systems that are broken mm-hmm. and connecting to, you know, Toby saying the person is not the problem. The problem is the problem and the multi-storied problem mm-hmm. of, of all these systems that are broken. And Hey, here's a space where we can talk about that. And then we have this pottery as another vehicle and these metaphors as vehicle. Yeah. I find um, what you're saying about the pieces and how pieces can represent different things to different people and how people can fit pieces together differently. And some people, you know, they have different shapes of pieces. They have different sizes. They fit them together uh, in creative ways. And all of it uh, is conversation that you're, you're stimulating with them as, as they're doing that. So what I, uh, I remember you mentioned something about this, uh, during your presentation, and I was wondering a little bit more about it. You know, you mentioned that the name of this tour is, I think you said it's Mending What's Broken, right? Mm-hmm. So how does like the discourse of broken, because that is a, a discourse that, you know, a lot of, it gets perpetuated a lot in cultures and uh, through families and through different ways, what does that look like with Kintsugi and, and just in general, if you could speak about like that discourse of, of being broken or brokenness and how you see all that yeah. with your work? Yeah, absolutely. And a great question. And again, it's multi-storied. And I guess that's the, like, the short answer is it's multi-storied. And, yeah. and it's an opportunity to talk about, you know, I lived a story for 40 plus years of my life of broken, forever broken and damaged because mm. of childhood sexual assault Mm -hmm. and a story that honestly was placed on me by psychiatric you know the the whole well you know on on this chart you're 15 times more likely to have this happen in addiction relationship Mm. and all this stuff so a story was placed on me yeah so i've learned some of this about others telling me i was broken and then feeling broken because of that yeah And, and so working with people to say when you hear the word broken what comes to mind for you? And so we talk about those layers and we get to talk about if the person's feeling broken to have curiosity of, you know, I wonder about, 
I wonder, and maybe this doesn't resonate at all, you know, everything's an invitation and not a, I'm not the expert, mm -hmm. but I, I wonder if broken, if there are systems that are broken that might be contributing to this story. Yeah. Or what do you think about the possibility of brokenness in stories that were placed upon you? What if that's what's broken? Mm. And, and many times the person themselves goes there. Like they'll, they'll have that recognition of, wait a minute, I'm not the one that's broken. It's this, this culture that I live in, this overarching society, these gender norms that don't fit me. Mm -hmm. um, so the layered story of broken comes out. So I hear you on the discourse and that's, and that's why we talk about it. And the mending what's broken, the reason I chose those words is because I have heard so many conversations about that everything is so broken right now. Things are so yeah. broken. The systems are broken. COVID has uncovered these things that have been broken for years, but now more people can see it. Mm -hmm. um, we have a massive racism problem in the U.S. And so it using those words, I recognize in narrative circles. You know, I remember on my paper, it was like, I don't know if you want to use mending what's broken. And I didn't for that paper. Mm -hmm. I used different words. Mm -hmm. But for this for everyday people, resonate with that phrase yeah and there's there's a connecting phrase to it mending what's broken how the metaphors and art of kintsugi might might um be useful in looking at the pieces or putting pieces together so there's and then there's a description yeah. right if I, if I call it you know discourse <laughs> part of magic, people are like what does that mean and that sounds that sounds like elevated i don't know you know what i mean like it yeah. doesn't sound that seems to be that seems it. to be a common theme in all of what you guys are sharing here is is the ways that you're able to meet people where they're at whether it's Toby yeah. with the silence or Kate um, with the the person who shared their story uh, in front of the, the the group at the book launch and here um, with this very intentional naming of this tour um, because I I don't know about you Kristen or anyone else but. Sometimes I find when I try to communicate narrative ideas with narrative language, I tend to not have people, I tend to either lose people or people can't keep up because some of the language is um, like, like an example, like I love reauthoring, like the language of reauthoring conversations. Right. And I had several people I consulted with about my business and asked like about a tagline. And I said, like, what do you think of this idea of reauthoring? And I got the same feedback every time they're like, it's, it, it's a phrase that a lot of mainstream, like just in general, at least I'm speaking here in America, they don't know what, they might not know what to make of that, you know, what that means. And, and so what I'm hearing there, Kristen, is you've, you're very intentional about the way that you're going to engage people because most people don't know what kintsugi is. A lot of people don't know what narrative practices are. So you have to be very conscientious of the language. And that is a discourse uh, that, people, that people see that they see in the world and they even can see in themselves personally. And so I think the way that you're able to connect with people through that and relate with that, it's, it's, it's quite wonderful and very inspiring for me. I had one. Yeah, yeah, go I ahead. Thing about in the, so in the description, I talk about narrative practice and I actually use one of my favorite, do I still have it over here? Yes. I use Alice Morgan's What is Narrative Therapy and Easy. Yeah, to that book is so great. I have that on my shelf too. And I do. I use her her um her very easy to understand definitions of things. So in the in the deeper like on the website, it there's more talking about, hey, what does this look like? And when I send things out to people that are more than just a, a little blurb, it talks about narrative practices. Yeah. I put that in the title, I've had the same thing where people are then, I don't want to do that. And it's not like we're going to fix, we're not going to mend all these things. Cause I know the word mending I had, I was like, Oh, can I use that word? Mm -hmm. Toby, I see. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm dying to say something. Yes. I saw your hand four <laughs> times. <laughs> I, I think that, you know, you use the word there inten intentional about the word you're using. Um, and and the people we work alongside are intentional about the words they use. And a big part of our practice in, in narrative is to, is to ask questions with the language in which we've been told. Mm. Right? Yeah. And so I think that 
I mean, I'm very intentional about every word I'm using, right? And so I, I challenge people who say who will say to me, you know, that word is not person-centered, or that word is oppressive, or that word is is not um, is not helpful. But like a word like broken, there, there's so much story in that word, and and I think that that that, that allows for discussion. Right. It allows for conversation. It allows for a story to be told. And that is that is our job. That yeah. is the role we're playing when we're holding space for people. I can tell you that many times I was told to change the language in my in my writing and I don't. I won't because it's it's I'm using the words intentionally. Right. Yeah. I say substance misuse for a reason. Yeah, because I think that it isn't you're not you're not abusing substance, you're misusing it, right? Um, we don't talk, you know, like, like there's, a, there's an intention behind it. And I think that's really important. And it's one of the things that I love about what you're doing, Kristen, is that I know that there's intention and I know that there's there's desire to provoke conversation. And that's, a you know, I have said this before about narrative as being punk. And it's really, I mean, yeah. think about when... Think about when it hit, when they started to talk about it. it was right at the beginning of punk breaking. I yeah, mean, that's true. That's like DOA, the Ramones, Circle Jerks. Those bands were oh, just yeah. sort of occurring in America and around the world. And I mean, it is it is all rooted in punk ethics. It's like, I'm, so it's so dear to me that way. But yeah, I think it's really important that we we use words intentionally and we use the words that, pe- that people have said to us, right? You know, yeah. and we, that we use that language back when we ask questions. Right? The title, to say that, that I didn't create the title. It was actually a group called Artists Standing Strong Together that I'm working with. Yeah. And, and it's mostly storytellers, but there's other, there's poets and spoken word and there's singer songwriters and some visual artists too. And it came from them when I was saying I wanted to do the Kintsugi workshop. And they said, if we put Kintsugi in the title, a very few people will know but what about mending what's broken? And then we brought it back to the group and asked, like, there were like 40 people in the room. What do you all think of this title? And they're like, that I understand. Mm -hmm. And I would want to go to that. Like, I would want to, I would want to explore that. And so it wasn't, and that, that, I think from a narrative standpoint, what you're talking about is it was also, it wasn't Kristen Padamonte coming up with, I'm going to call it mending what's broken. It was this other group that said, Hey, right. what about this? Does that capture it? And I love that, that crowdsourcing, you know, I'm, I always check in with other people. How does this, how does this land for you? What does this mean for you? Does this capture it? Does this make sense? And it seemed to. Well, and that's um, one thing. And, that's okay. And that's one thing, Kristen. And then I want to hear uh, Kate, if uh, what Kate's thoughts are on all this. Um, but that's one thing that like, for me, I've been just really hyper aware of lately is just, you know, we talk about this idea of, and how people, um, influence us and they, in, and, and they shape, uh, they shape us in, in many ways and recognizing, you know, kind of like what I shared in the beginning, I don't have to do this alone, you know, like just because we've all been through this master's program and we've got this thing on paper that says you're a quote unquote professional now, um, then it's like the expectation of, oh, well, then you must know exactly how to do this now. You must know how to go out there and what language to use and all that. And it's, it's really humbling to walk away from that and know that I'm trying to figure this out too, you know, and being able to invite people into that. And I love what you shared about going to this group and, and just kind of field testing it, if you will, and, and seeing that. And that's what I'm trying to do as well as I'm trying to just put things out there and see what's landing, what sticks and what doesn't. And just being okay with, um, being told like, no, that's not a good idea or no, that, that doesn't work. And just being, you know, being okay with that and having that freedom, um, to, to play around with that. So, Kate, uh, any thoughts that you wanted to share about what Kristen said? Yeah, look, Kristen, I think what you're doing is marvelous. I really do. I wish the Kristen show could come down here, and maybe it will one day. 
Um, and I want to say that narrative therapy, one of the things that it does really well and has been sort of skirted around and a little bit discussed here is the collaborative stuff. Narrative therapy and narrative therapists get it. They get that there needs to be collaboration of ideas, mm -hmm. of thoughts, of wrongs and rights to make something into a beautiful little treasure, whatever that treasure might be. And, you know, and Kristen, you explained it beautifully in just coming up with the name for your program. You know? Yeah, thank you so much. I'll get to Australia eventually. Yeah. I can't can't do it in my new tiny home camper van, but I'll figure it's you might. Float, Look, float, I had a, float, floatable I had a, and pliable. I had a client the other day where I asked him a question and his answer was like he looked at me just incredulously and he said, But the train goes in the sky. Because I wanted to know how this character was getting from A to B. Yeah. Because he was crossing continents. And he just like Pardon? Love it. Train goes in the yeah. sky. Well, there we go. Yeah. 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 Anything's possible. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Because yeah. it's like, what's what's wrapped up in that statement, you know? Because that's such a oh, creative somewhere. way of articulating so much about life. So that's this might be a good place to to wrap it um, because I feel like this has been, I don't know, you guys have fun? Yeah. Absolutely. Great. Thank you, Thank Darren. You. Yeah, no, this, this was a joy. And, you know, if you want to learn... Uh, more about uh, what any of, uh, you know, Kristen, Kate, Toby, what their work is. I'm going to have some links down in the show notes um, to where you can find them and um, just a little bit more about them. And so feel free to check out what they're doing. And if you're enjoying all things narrative and you're interested in, you know, bringing a workshop uh, to your community, to your group, uh, to, you know, maybe it's for teenagers, an after school program, uh, whatever it is that you're a part of, um, uh, feel free to reach out uh, at allthingsnarrative.com. You can email me. And I'd love to, you know, uh, continue to, to do this for as long as I'm here on this earth, being able to continue to bring this love of story and narrative and the stories we love, the stories we live, all these things, uh, bringing them to people. Uh, I like to say, you know, um, that I want to empower people to live a meaningful story, whatever that looks like for them, whatever, whatever that is, but being able to, you know, whatever story you find yourself in, is it meaningful to you? Is it life giving is, you know, your sense of purpose? Is it bringing you, um, more alive as you're living into it? So, yeah, and, and I just appreciate hearing the meaningful work that you're all doing as well. So, so this is your friendly narrative practitioner here, Derek, signing off, saying thank you again to Toby, Kristen, and Kate. And we'll be back next week to talk about the elements of story and how that ties in with narrative practices. So thank you so much and take care. <laughs>